So the day that I walked into the department, uh, I had an office at University in Fifth, the bank building on the second floor. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, it was uh, some people who were to me even, even then, as young as I was, uh, giants in the field of psychiatry. I had been trained at Washington University, St. Louis, certainly one of the only at the time biologically oriented psychiatry programs in the country other than perhaps Yale. And among the people who were so special to me uh, uh, was Sam Berendes. And Sam was there. He had always had a smile. His door was always open. If I had questions, he was always available. Uh, and it was a very important time for me in developing my career. Uh, Lou and Arnold were also always there and incredibly important to me. But right now, uh, we're just, I'm focusing specifically on a man we were very lucky to have. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, a shame that we lost him to UCSF. San Francisco is a gorgeous place, uh, and we're very happy to have him back right now to help us understand more about the beginnings of the department. So Sam Berendes. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Arnold, for a great warm-up. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. It's amazing, just amazing. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I want to explain, uh, I have a written talk here, which I'm going to give, uh, and it's because of, uh, of um, Mark. Mark said, look, you know, this is going to be a tight, everybody's going to speak. Everybody gets only 15 minutes. This is an egalitarian institution. I said, can I have a little bit more? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Egalitarian institution. No senior privileges. And so I uh, wrote it because I figured, uh, how am I going to fit in? And, and there was a lot more to say. And I was also told to um, talk about my personal past and why, you know, why, how, did I, how did I get here? We heard how Arnie got here. Uh, it was, you know, and my, my, my path was is, is different kinds of accidents, but life is full of accidents. Anyway. I'd like to begin by thanking Arnold for founding this great department and for having the faith to choose me as his first draft pick. Uh, my whole talk will in fact be about gratitude. First, my gratitude for the lucky breaks which gave me the credentials to be a good draft pick. Second, my gratitude for being here from day one to help shape a new department of psychiatry and a new program in neuroscience. Third, my gratitude for the memorable years, 16 memorable years that I spent here before moving north to UC San Francisco. So first, a few fortunate events that qualified me to come here in a very, very privileged position. Uh, the most momentous of these fortunate events happened in 1961. At 1961, at the N NIH intramural program in Bethesda, I had become interested in the effects of hormones on behavior and psychopathology as a medical student at Columbia, and after a long struggle, I had decided to go into endocrinology rather than psychiatry because it would make a better research career, I thought. And that was not a completely crazy uh, decision. So I interned in medicine at the Brigham and then went to the endocrine division of the NIH intramural program, which was then in its golden age. This is the intramural. They were university research programs were not well developed then in biomedical science. The NIH was really rocking. And it also had young people who came uh, to do their military service in the U.S. Public Health Service. So I was fortunate enough to uh, get into that program. We were called the Yellow Berets because uh, for, for reasons that you might expect, understand. And I plan to work on the, uh, the way the hypothalamus controls cortisol levels and influences behavior, which was a fairly traditional kind of thing in endocrinology and behavior at the time. But all of that changed when I met uh, Gordon Tompkins. 
a brilliant young lab chief at the NIH. And Gordon was probably only about seven years older than me. I was probably 25 or something. And there he is, Gordon Tompkins. And he, he transformed my life. Gordon had also been uh, trained in endocrinology, and he had become interested in the discovery the genes for certain bacterial enzymes, such as beta-galactosidase, could be turned on or off by substrate molecules, such as lactose. That was an incredibly important discovery at the time, largely made in Paris by uh, Jacob and Manot. And this regulatory process controls the amount of enzyme protein that the gene makes. And then Gordon had a big and extremely novel idea. What if hormones also work in a similar way? That is, what if hormones also turn on and off genes and regulate gene expression in particular tissues and regulate the expression of particular genes in particular tissues. This was all his idea. And, and it was novel. It was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And he shared this with me when I first met him. And Gordon had become so convinced of this idea, although the evidence he had for it at the time was quite limited, that as he put it to me when we had our first very seminal conversation, endocrinology is molecular biology. That's what he said. Endocrinology is molecular biology. I said, what's molecular biology? And he didn't t it didn't take long for him to persuade me that I'd better learn everything I could about molecular biology, this field which I'd never heard of, because endocrinology, the field that I was interested in, was molecular biology. So if you don't know that, man, you're out. You just forget it. You're out of it. So being set on this new path was not the only huge break that came from Gordon. To teach me the tools of molecular biology, Gordon arranged for me to work with a, another young uh, researcher, also of the same, just about exactly the same age as, as Gordon. Everybody's really young then, who was just getting started and, and who, he just had started his lab, he had one postdoc, and so he could use a pair of hands, even a pair of hands that knew really nothing about molecular biology. He was at the time developing tools to find out how messenger RNAs, which are copied from genes, and the idea of messenger RNA being copied from genes was itself still not established. But at any rate, that was the pretty well assumed uh, notion. And what Marshall was after with temerity, but was after, was how the information in uh, the DNA, which was transferred to the messenger RNA, was then translated into uh, the structure of the individual protein that the gene coded for. What was the genetic code? Um, this code, as we now know, translates the language of DNA and RNA, each of which have four constituents, four building blocks, into the language of proteins, which uses 20 amino acids, 20 building blocks. And so the question was, how do you take the information from sequences of four building blocks and then ultimately through, through RNA translate it into uh, protein structure, which is a sequence of 20 building blocks, the various amino acids. And Marshall had developed a very simple way to kind of look at this crudely using bacterial extracts, which I quickly learned how to make. So I became immediately very useful in doing experiments. And then miracle of miracles, and this was really miraculous. It was extraordinary. A few months after I started working with Marshall, lightning struck. Marshall had decided to try experiments with synthetic rather than natural RNAs, by which I mean RNAs that could be made in a test tube by a simple chemical process. So instead of using natural RNAs that you isolated from tissues, Marshall, Marshall or some 
collaborators started making us synthetic RNAs. And the first synthetic RNA, which Marshall used, was a long repeating chain made up exclusively of uridylic acid, whose symbol is U. Uridylic acid is the nucleotide in RNA, which is the equivalent of thymidine, or T, in DNA. All the others are the same in RNA and DNA, but U re replaces or stands in for T in RNA, as probably everybody knows. So he made this synthetic polynucleotide. And it was a complete shot in the dark. And there's much, th this is one of the most famous experiments in biomedical science. And so I know a lot about it, which I won't tell you, but it was a pretty, pretty wild experiment. And nobody expected this to work. It was just like, well, I need just to make this RNA. But it did. It did. First try, it worked. Not only worked, it was, it was spectacularly clear that it worked. And it made a protein. And it made a protein, amazingly, which had only one of the 20 amino acids, phenylalanine. Phenylalanine. And it was amazing. We did, nobody knew what to do with this. But to make a long story short, it became clear fairly soon that this experiment marked a discovery that U, 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 a sequence of three U's in RNA, is the genetic code for phenylalanine. The genetic code for phenylalanine. Nobody knew what the genetic code for phenylalanine was. Which opened a methodology for successfully deciphering the complete genetic code. The whole thing. There were some other wrinkles that were required, of course. One of the most fundamental discoveries in biology. So fundamental that seven years later, in 1968, Marshall won the Nobel Prize. The younger looking guy with the white bow tie is Marshall, that's the king. I guess that's the princess. And there he is, uh, 40, age 41 at the time, Nobel Prize. Came straight out of that, that experiment. And then the ability to harvest the technology that could be built on top of it to figure out the whole thing. This is the thing that if you open up molecular biology textbooks, where the periodic table of the elements is in chemistry books, this is what's in the molecular biology textbooks. It's the, it's the code. It's, we, every, everybody uses it every day. It's completely amazing. And I happened to be at the right place at the right time, and so I had made important contributions to this work, only because Gordon told me to go work with him, and he worked with him, and whatever, blah, blah. So never having, having never heard of molecular biology in 1961, Two years later, I was a valued and highly recognized molecular biologist and a member of what was the newspapers. I was a member of the Code of Life team. Okay. So this heady experience started me thinking that if endocrinology is molecular biology, maybe psychiatry is also molecular biology. I mean, why not? It's so easy, you just like figure it out, <laughs> okay? By this, I meant that if hormones work by regulation of gene expression, maybe there are controllers of brain functions, other controllers of brain functions, normal brain functions, abnormal brain functions, that also work by regulation of gene expression. It's not, it was not a bad idea, actually. But it was straight out of Gordon Tompkins. I mean, it's like, think big. So maybe I could, after all, have a research career in psychiatry, the field that I had been attracted to for so long. Okay, I mean, I, endocrinology no longer was the exclusive road to research. Psychiatry could be the road to research, too. It still could be the road to research. But now it would be a career that I could approach with newfound confidence by applying tools of the exploding field of molecular biology. So in the next six years, from 1963 to 1969, I did just that. First, I arranged to do a residency in psychiatry at McLean Hospital in Boston, or in Belmont, while also holding a special fellowship at the Harvard Medical School. This gave me a lab on the hospital grounds, 
an annual research budget of $5,000, and the opportunity to be the PhD advisor to a psychology graduate student, Hirsch Cohen. And during this whole time, I did the full residency, all of it, the patients, the outpatients, the inpatients, psychodynamic therapy for schizophrenic patients three times a week. I mean, I did it all. The centrifuges were turning and patients were turning. It's good. And during that time, Hirsch Cohen, my uh, graduate student, and I had started working on a, a, a way of uh, applying the thinking that Gordon was using in studying um, uh, regulation of gene expression under the influence of hormones by blocking it with um, protein synthesis or RNA synthesis inhibitors. And so we used the same approach. And we, we quickly found that um, if you give a protein synthesis inhibitor to a mouse wh while you train the mouse to learn something, the mouse remembers for a few hours, and then the memory is gone. By blocking regulation of gene expression and expression into proteins of what, some kind somewhere in the brain, Memory storage could be blocked. It's a very important experiment. And so we started working on that. And then uh, I uh, moved on after my residency. Oh, and during, we, we not only started working on it, we published a lot of papers in science and nature and the PNAS. I mean, we were, it was, this was really hot stuff. I took a job at, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York as an assistant professor, in part because I could have an appointment in both psychiatry and a department of molecular biology, which they had recently created, although I was basically in psychiatry. And there I began to study general characteristics of protein metabolism in neurons. I mean, if I was going to study protein metabolism in the brain, I would want to study fundamental characteristics of it based on the very primitive ideas and primitive technology that was available at the time, some of which I developed. And uh, I was particularly interested in the rate of transport of newly made proteins down axons to nerve terminals, because that's, cause that, in that way, by that route, they could influence synaptic function. So neurons make protein primarily in the cell body, and you've got to ship it down. How fast does that happen? I was also very interested in the stability of brain proteins. The idea at the time was that once the adult brain was made, since neurons don't replicate, they don't, they don't turn over with very rare exceptions. Almost, the, almost all the neurons in the brain are, are that you had as, as a child are yours forever. They don't, they don't replicate. So it was believed that the brain was therefore probably in terms of protein metabolism very, very static. That was kind of the dogma at the time. It turned out that the brain proteins actually turned over extremely rapidly, including proteins that were believed to be structural proteins, like microtubule proteins, which were very, very easy to study, and which I spent some time studying, which in the mouse brain had a half-life of four days. I mean, they were just like being made, and it was completely amazing. So at any rate, uh, uh, did that, and uh, the upshot of all this was that uh, uh, brain proteins and brain structure, the structure of neurons, were actually r remarkably plastic. And, and this was the, the, the idea that brain plasticity is important. Uh, by the way, I'm going, Mark, I, I know you guys are talking. I'm going over my time. Because yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm getting into it here. And yes. I, I figure, I figure. About, we're actually not talking about no, no, I wasn't. I didn't think you were talking about me. I wanted to call your attention to me so that you would listen to me. You weren't on, you're not talking about me. You weren't even listening to me. Can I give up? Can I give up? Perhaps you could start all over again. No, I could. I could, if, with your permission. So anyway, brain plasticity. So, so, this, is, so this is all very good. I, I obviously don't have time to... Uh, uh, go through this, but I, I will show you a couple of slides which I chose specifically to provide you for evidence that when, so we're talking about not, that, that, that when Arnold, Arnold found me, that he actually, w it was reasonable for him to consider me a, a promising 
draft pick. It was not, it was not a completely capricious action, despite the fact that he presented it that way. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the first evidence. Oh, here we go. Huh? All right. Oh, this is the cover of a book, Cellular Dynamics of the Neuron, that I was invited to edit in 1968. As you can see, it's the summary of the symposia, the, it's the eighth symposium of the International Society of Cell Biology. And I, uh, so I edited this book and uh, I also wrote the preface. So up there is the, uh, the preface, which will give you a, an idea of what was going on at the time, and I'll read it to you. Uh, Until recently, only electrophysiological studies could provide information about dynamic aspects of neuronal function. In this context, the neuron was considered as an electronic component, a black box, which receives, integrates, and transmits impulses. Other relevant properties of neurons seem inaccessible to study. However, with increasing knowledge of cellular regulation, it is becoming possible to view this black box as a living cell and to complement electrophysiology with the methods of cell biology and biochemistry. A rich and multifaceted neurobiology is developing. So this vision was one that would, would seem to be worth developing and supporting. So the second piece of evidence that I'm going to offer is a staged photo made by the Public Relations Department in Einstein. You see, this is the scientist at work, okay? And in addition to showing that Einstein thought I was photogenic enough to use for fundraising, there's one detail which I'd like to call to your attention. I, I don't have a pointer, but if you look in the background, there are those white rectangles on the wall. The wall is made up of white rectangles. Okay? When Einstein recruited me at the end of my residency, their psychiatry department, and Arnold has already set the stage for this by explaining what it was going to be like here at UCSD too. Their psychiatry department didn't have a single square foot of uh, lab space, wet lab space. Anyway. But the good news at Einstein was that the Department of Psychiatry happened to be very rich in men's rooms. <laughs> so once I was hired, the order went out to build me a lab in the largest available men's room. <laughs> and all the work I did in my three very productive years at Einstein was done in this repurposed toilet <laughs> whose history is commemorated by those rectangular white tiles. And so such constraints on lab space and facilities were not forgotten by me when uh, was here at UCSD talking about possibly coming here, and so I'd like to, to, to spend, and, and as you'll hear, it worked out better than it did there. I'd like to spend a few minutes telling you about how this came about. So in early 1969, I had a phone, phone call from the newly built Salk Institute inviting me to meet with members of their external advisory board, since they were becoming interested in neurobiology. The external advisory board at the time consisted, amongst others, of Francis Crick, Jacques Minot, the guy who discovered regulation of gene expression in bacteria, um, several other Nobel laureates, Jonas Salk, and we sat down and had a little talk about neurobiology. It, said it, was, it was great. And it turns out I learned subsequently that they were thinking of recruiting me to a position there. Uh, but something more wonderful happened instead. Arnold had just been appointed the chair of psychiatry. 
And he, he had heard I was coming around. He was desperately looking for somebody to come join him at this, you know, this, this new, uh, unknown. Uh, and I hadn't realized the last place that they, you know, that is under-resourced, which he didn't tell me about, department. Okay. So we, we, we arranged to meet, and we, we, Arnold and I immediately hit it off. We were just like, one, one, was, one was crazier than the next. I mean, it was just like, anything goes, right? And so much so that Arnold was, was, was willing to make me an incredibly generous offer. A full professorship, which I was three years out of my residency. I got that? Three. three. Full professor. Actually, not at a step one, but at some element, because that would, that would be too modest. With tenure, tenure, okay. Brand new lab space, all you want. I mean, which I didn't realize he didn't have any possession of it. So. <laughs> but he did, it didn't work, worked out. And an important role in developing the new department, which consisted of him and me, so it's like. So no more remodeled men's rooms. And very important, no more worrying about the price of New York City real estate or where to send my two little girls to kindergarten. It was an offer I and my family just couldn't refuse. So not long after, on December 1st, 1969, I, my wife Ellen, and our three and five-year-old daughters, Elizabeth and Jessica, squeezed into our overloaded Plymouth Valiant and headed west. We had a grand road trip, stopping at all kinds of interesting places. And on December 10th, we came down the hill to La Jolla, and you could see the ocean. And we settled in a place we had rented on Arena Street, right off La Jolla Boulevard, little temporary, little, little Spanish house. It, deliciously close to Carino's Pizza, which I think may still be there. And there, there was an old Baskin Robbins just down the street. Still there. Yeah. Well, the old, the old, the, the Baskin Robbins has moved. But, but whatever. Anyway, <laughs> there was, there was, it was great. It was great. Sukasa had just opened up. It was like we could. Really. And several months later, we moved up to Mount Soledad on Kearsarge Road in a home which was in walking distance of La Jolla Elementary School, had a little bit of an ocean view, and was ours for a heavily mortgaged sum of $50,000. Yeah. Not bad. I started work immediately uh, as the only fac fa faculty member besides Arnold. I had to do everything, teach the classes, you know. And Arnold was I did, the, you know, it was like there was this chief in the Indian. I was the Indian. And you, you mentioned the bank. So I remember the bank very well because I had an office. In, when I first moved into the bank, I had an office in the vault, the bank vault, which I thought was kind of really cool uh, because it was, you know, it was this, you know, it's like the Willie Sutton line, you know, why, why do you want to be in the bank? It's where the money is, right? Was, okay. So I was in the bank vault. And we and that was that became as Pat no, the, that became the Gifford the whole you remember the whole story of the Gifford Clinic, and this spirit it was a startup. We were like this was startup, so and this spirit continued. I mean, you know, Igor came, Mark came, others came, and the faculty started started appearing, and. <clears throat> My research program could, could get started right away because I could transfer NIH grants that I, I had already received while I was at Einstein. I could also use the salary lines on those grants to bring along a postdoc, Gary Dutton, and also to entice Larry Squire, whom I met when he was a postdoc at Einstein, to come work with me on protein synthesis and memory until he could qualify for a uh, an independent position. And bringing Larry Squire along was probably one of my more lasting and valuable contributions to UCSD. And he was here from basically the very start. And there were also other fish to fry. 
I was particularly eager to help integrate the Department of Psychiatry into the rest of the university. Um, neglected though we were, Arnold, right? Okay. And so to get started, I enlisted the help of Bob Livingston, who was the head of neuroscience at the time, and John Singer, a leading professor of uh, biology in what was already an esteemed department of biology. Oh, by the way, I didn't switch the slide to show that we're now at UCSD, La Jolla. And um, together, uh, this was actually not an unattractive part of the package as well. Um, together we submitted a grant to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to support the development of an interdepartmental neuroscience consortium, which I served as principal investigator and which we had and was very generously funded by the Sloan Foundation, which had a lot of money and was very eager to put something into this new burgeoning field of neuroscience. So we had very good support. It allowed us to support stipends for graduate students, stipends for postdoctoral fellows, startup money. It was altogether a wonderful opportunity. And as I look back on the early years of the department, I, I'm especially proud of organizing that and establishing from the very beginning that the Department of Psychiatry would be highly integrated with all kinds of departments in the med medical school. And whatever the leadership might think, we were going to be players, important players, from the very beginning. And uh, as I look around and as I see in looking at the program for the symposium, this obviously has gone on and continued and flourished over the many years. So thank you again for inviting me to look back at uh, my time here and how I got here. Uh, as I look at the audience, I see some familiar faces in front. I can make out some. There are a lot of people here that I still remember and in various capacities. I, I was speaking to Dom Adario just as I came in, who, who thanked me for interviewing him. And I don't know, he'll, he'll get up here and maybe want to make a little testimonial about how. There are maybe a few others who want to make testimonials about how wonderful it was. Others who might have other, <laughs> other sorts of comments. But at any rate, thank you very much for having me. Uh, to me, this is an incredibly wonderful event, 50 years. Having, having been here at the very, very beginning, uh, I'm very proud to have been part of uh, this, this great Department of Psychiatry, uh, which will only go on to flourish and to even higher uh, achievements in the years to come. So thank you. Thank you very much.